So I run this organization called Rethink Food. Um, it's a really interesting organization with a really, really, really bright group of people, including myself, um, to <laughs> sit around and talk a lot about solving food insecurity, what do we do about the excess waste, how do we figure out ways to use it in our, uh, in our food economy. Um, and that's the core of what we do. So we have a truck, trucks in a kitchen and we drive around the city, we collect this excess and then we redistribute it. We make meals out of it and we redistribute it to those in need. It's actually um, the food model kind of system that we've developed over time has never really changed since really the dawn of the soup kitchen. Um, and Rethink is a new approach, a new way to look at that idea by taking the pressure off the community service organizations and the kitchens. Um, Rethink has a policy that we do not share images of what we say like the homeless or the food insecure. So I'm going to share actually a very personal story with you that I've never shared with uh, publicly and actually never really shared with my closest friends. Um, so am I am going to show you somebody who did go through a food insecure situation and it is, voila, me. Um, when I was a kid, uh, I grew up in a small town <clears throat> outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And, you know, family of four, and my parents got divorced like many parents did, you know, around that time. And what happened is, is two bills, one mortgage turned into a mortgage and a rent, a car payment turned into two car payments, and then finally one food bill turned into two. And actually, divorce and, and uh, health care bills are the two most prominent reasons that people get thrown into food insecurity. And the reason that I'm showing you this is because food insecurity is actually something that affects a lot of us. And I would dare to say even a large group of people, a large number of people in this room have had to deal with it in some way in their lives. But essentially that was my introduction to food insecurity. It's not that I was starving or you know, living in you know, homeless or anything like that. It's just that, well, there wasn't enough food or enough money to cover it. And my father, who did absolutely everything that he could to figure it out, often had to choose between a trip to the grocery store or the electricity bill. And sometimes the electricity would go out and the grocery store bill would win. Uh, even today, my relationship with food insecurity not only inspires me, but still kind of haunts me. And I'm not saying this here today because I want you guys to like be like, oh, poor, poor, poor chef from 11 Madison Park. <laughs> I bet you don't eat well. Uh, <laughs> you can all see. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm saying this because I want to share with you that, that food insecurity is in fact everywhere. And one in six children in our beautiful city actually experience it, and even numbers that say one in four. Um, it's a really, really, really big problem. And it's not always, like I was saying, you know, like a starving kid on the side of the street, it's often just empty cupboards and making that decision between what's important. In many ways, I think this is exactly why, and uh, as my fiance likes to point out very clearly, that I was driven towards food. And when I started at the University of Kansas, I couldn't really uh, afford it, and I was having some minor credit issues, um, and I couldn't get student loans. So as I you know, began my time in Kansas, I quickly gravitated and got a job at a bakery. And this was the first time that I saw excess. And I was able to eat everything that I wanted. I could eat as many muffins that I, my heart desired. It, it was still pretty sick. I think it's awesome. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it changed my life. But then I got this job. I got so entwined with it that I got a job at the only fine, and believe it or not, there are fine dining restaurants in Kansas. I know this is New York City. But uh, the, uh, one of the only fine dining restaurants in Kansas. And uh, I got a job as a dishwasher. And I had, uh, one night I was cleaning up after the end of service and I, you know, the sommelier said, hey, you can take home the rest of this wine. And I was like, this is sick, it would be great, like, you know, and I scraped up the rest of this risotto that was kind of in the, like an old saute pan, there's some scallops, I packed it up, threw it in my backpack, I went home. And I remember sitting there in my like awful, awful apartment, uh, $325 a month for rent in Lawrence, Kansas. And I had my dog and I was eating my risotto and I was drinking this probably very old corked bottle of wine. And I felt like a king. I felt empowered. I haven't had a meal like that in so long. Simply by enjoying and sharing the equity that's in our food system, it made me feel great. So after that, I moved on to try to be the absolute best chef that I could possibly be. Which is a whole nother story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as with many establishments, 
the issue is, is that restaurants don't know what to do with it. And there's actually a myth that restaurants have to face, that it is illegal to donate your food, that you can be held liable, that you'll donate it to the soup kitchen and by, on Monday and by Friday, you know, the Bowery Mission is gonna own 11 Madison Park. It's simply not true. It's, um, it's just not true. <laughs> there is another irony that truly upsets me in the food industry. And this is one that you find your cooks, like me, a cook that was at this restaurant, going home and like, having to kind of sort through the scraps in order to get to make and to feed myself. And for chefs and people who make food that have families, it's almost impossible, due to the wealth inequality that's, that is in New York, to have a system in which you make $40,000, $35,000 a year as a line chef, doing something that you're very passionate about, and go home and actually have a fruitful and beautiful life. And this problem is in a lot of different industries. And it's not the fault of the rich. It's not the fault of, really, the government. The issue is, is that we're simply not sharing. And that's what we try to do at Rethink. At Rethink, all we do is incentivize sharing. And at Rethink, we also talk about one very, very important note, and it's the analogy, the value of a carrot. And this is the idea that I'm going to leave you guys with is that you think about a carrot, and it's grown, and it's like five to 10 cents, right? And then they give it to a producer, and that producer packs it up in boxes, and then they ship them off to markets. Those markets raise the price, maybe 10, 15, 20%. And then it goes to a restaurant, and then Thomas Keller t touches it, and now it's worth $500. <laughs> and at the end of the day, it's worth zero. That's insane, right? Like if we threw away every 2018 Toyota, <laughs> because the 2019 came out, that would be crazy. Or if every time I always, the joke that I make constantly, and maybe you'll get it, that the, if Gap could put an expiration date on their shirts, they definitely would. <laughs> but we don't. And it's not illegal to donate food. So what Rethink does is we try to maintain that equity, that value, and we're persistent about it as we move on. And finally, I had the pleasure of spending a lot of time in a communities all around New York City. And I'll tell you something, in this city, even as a Midwesterner, there is no shortage of love here, and I think we all know that about New York. But I will tell you, there is a ton of shortage for affordable housing, jobs that pay well, um, and a lot of food. I can't fix any of those problems, but I know that I can fix food. That transference, just like me, back when I was a young cook in Lawrence, Kansas, drinking that, eating that old risotto and having that corked bottle of wine, it made me feel powerful. And if I can give that feeling to a thousand people every single day, that would change lives. That dignity, that respect. And that's not what I love about Rethink. What I love about Rethink is that, ris that risotto and that wine drove me and made me feel like I could actually do something with my life. It pushed me, a poor kid, all the way to Copenhagen and to France and to fine dining restaurants in New York and Chicago. That's what did it. So when I think about meals, whole beautiful meals that we distribute at Rethink, I don't think about that. I don't think about, oh great, somebody gets a free meal. I think about how that empowers them to change the world. The same way that the risotto did that for me. I believe in a world where we can, food can be rethought where the newest innovation in food doesn't have to be simply just dropping off ingredients at your front door with some vague, vague description on how to cook them. That's a, that's a blue apron joke. <laughs> <laughs> where we can change the scale of food distribution nationwide forever and always, where we can make a holistic, more equitable, more peaceful, and more natural place that just doesn't help sustainability, which we all know is a major issue, but the economy and every single individual. Thank you.